I think <clears throat> this is the time for the <clears throat> applicant to uh, <clears throat> make his comments or reply. Thank you. Very grateful. Your Honor, I didn't quite have time to bunch the uh, claimant's points into categories so that they can be dealt with at once. So my apologies, my submission might be slightly repressive on the basis I'm just going to deal with the, with the points as he made them during the course of his submission. Um, the first point my learned friend made 
very briefly was that the uh, if the I, I think generally the complaint was that the statement of defence wasn't filed and therefore that somehow um, precludes this immediate judgment being given. Um, first thing I'd say is that there is nothing in the rules that prevents an immediate judgment application being brought at any time um, and it's not reliant upon any defence being filed. Uh, that's the first point. In fact, it's an inherent advantage of a summary judgment process or immediate judgment process that you can do that because, frankly, it's to get rid of um, unmeritorious claims quickly without having to file pleadings, etc. Now, drafting a, def a full defence um, to a claim like this, which would, would be defended vigorously, is going to cost more funds. And uh, frankly, the decision was taken at a point in time, and the timing is irrelevant, again, as to how long it took, but the client needed to make a decision uh, whether to bring this image of judgment application or not. There's nothing suspicious about having brought it before the CFC. The reason there was a rush to do that was because the defendant wanted the process for the media judgment application and the fact that um, it would like the main claim to be stayed until the media judgment application is determined, considered by the judicial officer. And that's why there was a rush to get it in at that time. There was no other reason, and even if there was, that's not a bar to bringing the immediate judgment application. <coughs> in that regard, I must um, state for, on behalf of my client that there was no uh, acceptance that it was required to file an amended defence by any time. Uh, my interpretation of the order um, read in light of the uh, transcript which we've sent an email about, or at least the transcription of the video recording of the hearing was that the judicial officer allowed for the defendant to file a statement of defence as amended, but did not dictate when, the implication being that it, it would be <coughs> after the immediate judgment is determined if it's against us. The, my learned friend stated that it has a right to see the defence. I don't know what right that is based on. Um, it's up to a party who is a defendant whether to file a defence or whether not to, or to bring its application for immediate judgment before or after it files its defence. There's no right to see an event. Um, there was quite a lot of time spent talking about the need for witness evidence from the defendant's side. Um, I cannot agree enough that if this matter was taken to a trial, where all of the issues that have been complained about were to be tried, witness evidence would be very important, including disclosure of documentation would be very important. That is accepted. The point is that doesn't deviate from the fact that, our, uh, uh, that the defendant has brought an application for immediate judgment based on inapplicability of GIC law and time bars. If those two proposals, propositions that we have put forward are accepted, the facts and evidence become completely irrelevant. So my learned friend can talk about um, the letters that were sent or not sent and the discussions that were had, all of which are denied, I should say, um, as much as he wants. And uh, there is a very much a sense of unfairness that's been presented today in relation to um, the claimant. But frankly, uh, it's not relevant to this application today. This application is beside those two uh, principles that, that um, is part of the application. Um, the, my learned friend also confuses uh, with, with respect the difference between evidence and pleadings. Uh, his suggestion was that if witness evidence is put forward, um, there would be a response to the case. That is not what witness evidence does. Witness evidence is simply someone's recollection of what happened and presenting it in a statement and swearing to it by way of statement of truth. It doesn't deal with whether they brought the claim under the right law or whether they have the right cause of action, etc. That's for the purposes of lawyers to, to debate. The other statement, um, sorry, the next statement that my learned friend made was that um, 
if I understood it correctly, is that the DIFC law or regulatory law or both apply everywhere to a central establishment's activities. Again, I, he didn't respond to paragraph 117 of the IGPL Court of Appeal judgment, which I tried my best to emphasize in my um, earlier submission. The one that talks about the idea that you can have um, uh, a regulatory law <coughs> apply from the DIFC everywhere where SEB has a branch, and that's the one which the Court of Appeal called fanciful. And if that wasn't agreed with, or if that is somehow considered to have been wrong or distinguished, that means that the laws of the DIFC and the DFSA regulations will apply in every location where Standard Chartered Bank has a branch, not just onshore Dubai or onshore UAE. It would apply in Singapore, it would apply in India, it would apply elsewhere, which frankly cannot be the right position. And again, I refer to paragraph 117 because I can't say it as well as um, the Court of Appeal has said it in, in, in that provision or as clearly. <clears throat> um, it's interesting to note, and I, I say this as someone who has some involvement in the current case as well as the IGPL case and the Saracen case, that the current um, case was, was clearly about jurisdiction. And I've said that several times, we've got the jurisdiction of the DIFC courts. The current case, interestingly, said nothing about requiring the applicability of DIFC law over the dispute. In fact, the dispute between the parties was governed by uh, either English law or UAE law, onshore UAE law. DIFC law was not applicable. So the idea that just because you've attracted DIFC court jurisdiction through the logic of Collins, that there, there should, therefore should be uh, DIFC law imposed on that case, makes um, no sense, and it certainly doesn't follow the logic in Corinth, which is the foundational case for establishing DIFC court jurisdiction over central establishments. The first time I have heard the, the um, submission that um, agreeing to the law designated by the parties is uh, contrary to public order and morals um, under the Judicial Authority Law Article uh, 6 was today. Um, I, I cannot see how the, um, my learned friend is arguing that point, but I think what he's saying is that um, if the DFSA rule book and the DIFC laws didn't apply to this transaction, then that would be a public mor morality issue or a public order issue. Uh, that completely disregards the fact that there is a legal regime which is um, equal to the DIFC's legal regime. <coughs> that occurs outside the DIFC across the road. And that is the uh, uh, law and regulation which governs banking activity onshore. Um, so to say that it's a public uh, morality issue or a public order issue to not apply DIFC law uh, undermines onshore UAE, the onshore UAE legal system. <coughs> My learned friend then talks about uh, two types of law governing um, uh, commercial relationships. One is the law agreed by the parties, and the other is the law of the jurisdiction, I think he was trying to say, which um, imposes laws over what the parties can agree amongst themselves. And I think his point was that whilst two parties can agree a particular law to apply to their commercial arrangements, you can't deviate from the uh, protective law of regulation or uh, um, uh, of legislation. And I agree with that. That is correct. You cannot um, contract out of certain protections. Our submission is not that uh, the DIFC law and regulation simply um, uh, doesn't apply ever and you can, you can contract your way out of it. That's not the case. The point is that did this activity occur in or from the DIFC to even open up that argument? <coughs> or did it occur elsewhere under a different legal, legal regime? It occurred elsewhere under a different legal regime, and that's not in dispute. I ju just on that note, I would add that if I entered into a contract with a party in the DIFC, and I sought to say, well, the law which governs our uh, financial transaction is English law, no matter what English law says, I cannot remove the uh, provisions of DFSA uh, rulebook or DIFC regulations because I'm conducting the activity here. I accept that. But 
I, this is not a case where the transaction was happening here or had any connection to here. In fact, um, it occurred uh, on shore. Um, there is a danger in quoting selectively from cases, as I've um, stated before. Again, as I mentioned, Saracen, uh, as well as the other cases, are fundamental, very hard-fought litigations before this court that were subject to very, very long judgments from the Court of First Instance and the Court of Appeal. And they must be looked at in context if we're trying to, if my learned friend is seeking to rely on them. Saracen, uh, the point with Saracen that my learned friend was trying to make was that the defendant's conduct was subject to the DFSA rulebook, even though the defendant was outside of the jurisdiction. That's, in, with all due respect, too simplistic a view of that case. That case was by a group of individuals who were family members who had brought a case against two defendants. One was a DIFC court entity, the other was a Swiss bank. The point that my learned friend was trying to make was that the court found that these two entities acted in or from the DIFC and therefore are subject to the DFSA rulebook. That's what the court found. With respect to the Swiss bank, the court in the first instance case by uh, Mr. Justice Chadwick, um, if I can just refer you, it's a very, very detailed analysis, but it is in Authorities Bundle 3, tab 28. Paragraph 3.7, so that's page 88 of that bundle. In that case, uh, page, number. page 88 of the bundle, yes. there was an <coughs> extremely detailed analysis and days of submission. I'll, I'll, I'll allow you to. No, that's not sure. the I took my note and go ahead, go ahead. So there was a very detailed analysis with days of submission about whether the Swiss entity, the Swiss bank, which is the second defendant, conducted financial services in or from the DIFC. And the court found that it did, on the basis that, frankly, that the Swiss bank didn't ever visit the DIFC or hold meetings here. The court found that it, it was acting in or from the DIFC through its agents, and those agents were the first defendant. Okay. That is a very different case to the one we have before us. Standard Charter Bank was not acting in the DIFC through some agency, or even on its own. Standard Charter Bank DIF Dubai branch, the Dubai branch was acting in this case. So to lump in both defendants as being subject to DFSA law without mentioning that is, is frankly not, not right and has no application to this case. Then refer to the description of the IGPL case, um, which my learned friend brought up again. He quoted from a paragraph which talks about the uh, jurisdiction of the DFC court. Again, that's what this case is about. That's paragraph 119. Um, there is nothing in that paragraph, and I urge um, Your Honour to read that paragraph again. In fact, that paragraph suits our position which is that just because the court takes jurisdiction over a case does not mean that it must apply the law of its jurisdiction. That's simply not what IGPL said. And I emphasize paragraphs 116 and 117 as stating the position, again, as clearly as can be stated. The next point that my learned friend made was with respect to the um, correspondence between the parties and the fact that, uh, and, and I, with respect, I'm not sure I completely followed the point, but somehow that the, uh, because there wasn't an approval requirement from the central bank for this product, therefore some other regulation should apply, whether it's FCA regulation, which hasn't been pleaded, um, or DFSA regulation, which has been pleaded. 
Um, in either case, that cannot be right. Just because a jurisdiction doesn't have a approval process for a particular product does not mean you can just impose one onto it, um, even if it's through this court jurisdiction argument, which again, I don't agree with. The fact is that the central bank approval requirement was just not required at the time. It later did become a requirement. And in fact, Standard Chartered Bank applied for approval for that product and obtained it from the central bank. The other point, and I, I hasten to enter into a discussion of the facts because um, as our submission is that is completely not relevant to this immediate judgment application. Um, but my learned friend highlighted um, several uh, pieces of correspondence, and one in particular where uh, the claimant asked for a safe product, which was capital protected, etc. Um, that is exactly what he got, a capital protected product. Um, however, he decided to borrow money to enhance his returns on that product. Now, a lot of people uh, would have uh, done that at the time, and a lot of people were affected by the fact of the financial crisis, which was completely unexpected. Um, so I don't think um, one can rely on the fact that um, he asked for a safe product uh, to determine uh, that that's what he should have got when he leveraged the investment with $2 million. And I should correct myself, I think just for the transcript at least, in my first submission I, I referred to the claimant of getting his $3 million back. He was never going to get his $3 million back. It was, if anything, $1 million on the um, capital protected product, which in essence he got. <coughs> he was just set off against what he owed on the loan. My learned friend also suggested that um, normally, well, his words, all products are required to be approved. I, I don't see any basis for that. Um, if the UAE didn't have a pro product approval process, under the central bank regime for this product, it didn't. There's no, um, there's no illegality there. And my learned friend suggested that it would be interesting, and therefore this trial pro should proceed, to understand the date of the execution of the loan agreement. I, um, I think I agree. It would be interesting to know what the date of the loan agreement was, but that's again, completely irrelevant to the immediate judgment application. This is about the applicability of DIFC law and time bars, nothing else. Um, it is not a function of the court to determine issues um, by way of merely curiosity or investigation. The DIFC rulebook has a provision, part 24, which allows a claim to be shut off quickly if it doesn't have any basis. And frankly, the only uh, application that's being brought today is the immediate judgment application, nothing on the facts. The uh, suggestion made by my learned front friend was that uh, the laws of the UAE or English law in the interest rates swap can only mean DIFC law in this context. Um, I would just like it for the record that I, I um, don't agree with that argument. Um, the laws of the UAE have been applied in this court many, many times, so of English law in relation to contractual relationships. He also suggested that the DIFC court is the <coughs> competent court. Again, I reject that. The, the UAE courts could well have heard this uh, matter. Um, the my learned friend then talks about the time bar, which I've only got a couple of small points to make. Um, in relation to that, I think my learned friend was seeking to establish that it was only on the 10th of July 2013 when um, the set-off occurred and the IRS expired that the cause of action accrued. Um, the reason for that is because, as I understand it, the claimant was seeking information from the uh, defendant and wasn't receiving it, which is denied. Um, and secondly, that he always had a hope um, that at some point SEB would make him whole or listen to him or, 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 or handle his complaint in a way which would uh, put him back in the money or satisfy his needs or whatever it was. Um, 
There is nothing in the time bar rules in the DIFC laws which talk about um, the point at which your action accrues is when your hope runs out. There's nothing in the DIFC rules on time bars which says that in determining uh, when your time starts to run, you'll have to know the exact figure of your damages. That's not the case. It's very clear that from 2009 and possibly 2010, if we uh, are being generous, the claimant understood that it had lost a significant sum in his eyes and that it was SEB's responsibility for that. That's very clear from the letter he wrote to uh, Mr. Jeremy, whose surname I forget, but it was Travis, Jeremy Travis, thank you, uh, or in 2011. He had stated that he's lost monies, he's very upset about the way he was treated, etc. And that was over six years ago. So there's nothing in the rule book that says you must know exactly how much your loss was before your action can accrue. And there was a point made about um, time not beginning to run until the bank issued an official letter stating what the client has lost. Again, there is no basis for that at law. Um, the, there was communication, which we uh, uh, alluded to in our submissions, which demonstrated what the loss was. Um, it was in an email, it had a formal document attached, but there's nothing in DIFC law uh, or procedural or UAE law that requires um, time to stop, excuse me, I should say DIFC procedural law in terms of time bars to require that there is an official uh, letter with a letterhead to be sent in order for the uh, time to accrue. The, the DIFC law dictates um, what, what I had said in my skeleton, and then fundamentally it's about awareness and uh, acknowledgement of the um, cause of action. if you can clarify <coughs> some issue I have in uh, my thought <coughs> before we uh, give opportunity to the claimant to, to respond. Now, my uh, understanding and new position, you are applying the application for default judgment. Immediate judgment. Absolutely. Immediate judgment uh, based on the Main, the main basis is that the law applicable here is not shouldn't be a DIFC law, right? So to start with, you are not arguing at all about the jurisdiction of the DIFC court. Absolutely not. At this yeah, point. We, we've accepted the DIFC court's jurisdiction. But somehow, <clears throat> in your submissions, you are arguing about the, the right party has to be sued in this case, whether it is DIFC entity or it is Dubai entity. I mean, a standard charter bank in Dubai or a standard charter bank in DIC. So this is one of those underlying, let's say, perception that the right or the claimant brought and wrote, the defendants here in this claim uh, is a wrongful party being brought to the DIC. This is my own analysis of your underlying position. Um, That will lead to another po point whether to decide whether the defendant being brought to this case is the wrong party or wrongful party. This is something has to be dealt with in the main trial or this is, could be dealt with in the default immediate uh, judgment uh, um, application. I will lead you to yes, that. Thank you. This is first analysis. The second point is when you <coughs> assuming that this case shouldn't be governed by the DIC laws and regulations, then you put as an alternative, it should be a UAE laws, uh, which is govern the transaction or relevant transaction, or it should be an English law. Now, those two set of different laws and regulations 
has to be brought to the DIFC court, or to me at least, through an expert opinion. Uh, to, analyze, uh, to, analyze, uh, to analyze the position where the UAE law, what is the limitation in UAE law, or what is the, uh, what is the term governing the UAE contract law or bank, um, banking regulation in UAE. So all of those type of uh, regime has to be brought to the DIC court, assuming that the DIC court will apply the UAE law in your uh, position through an expert opinion. Even if it is we're going to apply the English law, still for this court has, has to uh, listen to the expert in English law, whether to deal with the admitted judgment or uh, deal with the substantial dispute. Which is not the case we have here right now. I, mean, I don't have any expert in law has been brought to me, whether in UAE, what is their position uh, in terms of limitation, or even in English law. <coughs> So, I, I am in the situation where first <clears throat> I get that perception, might be wrong or right, that underlying you are saying the claimant brought this claim against wrongful party, which is not, so, not supposed to be standard at the bank, DIC, it should be a Dubai branch. Because all the transaction has been made there, so this is why this case shouldn't go further and we should dismiss the claim. Uh, which is not the case. This is not your main argument. This is only my analysis of your sure. underlying argument. What is in my initial thought is whether we're going to deal with the wrong, wrongful party being brought to this case, or whether we're going to deal with the, a law which is needed, an expert in law, an expert opinion in law. Uh, the, all those scenarios have to be dealt with in the trial, not in the, uh, before the trial time. Um, so I hope I express my, my, my two points in yes, this. Absolutely. Uh, first, uh, whether you argue about the right or wrong party has been brought to this procedure. Second, whether in your position, if we're not going to apply the IC law, then which law we need to apply? And in this scenario, we need to have an expert in law, which is need to go to trial and through the uh, pre-trial or through the needed application. So, so, thank you. Um, th the first point in relation to the, to the wrongful party, um, that's not at all um, my client's position. The, the party is the correct one. The legal analysis in Corinth in relation to what a legal personality is, and in IGPL, and many, many other cases in English law and UAE law, is that the company, the corporate personality, is is unified, it's just one thing. That entity has branches around the world, within the DIFC, outside of the DIFC, in Singapore, in India, in various, many other places. Um, the, you can only bring the legal action against the entity. Now sometimes in claims people put the branch name with the, or the branch address with the name of the entity, so it designates where that action was done. Uh, or, or which uh, branch of the company should deal with the claim. There is absolutely no suggestion that we consider that the claim was brought against the wrongful party. The claim was brought against Standard Charter Bank. There's only one. There's no, there's no more of them. But not the party which has been, <clears throat> not the branch who's dealt, who's dealt, who de who de who dealt with the claimant. But that, uh, that branch is the same as Standard Charter Bank here. It's the same entity. Yeah, sure. It's the same analysis, staff. Just uh, analysis. Some, yeah, absolutely. No, somewhere absolutely. when you mentioned yeah. referring to the no, no, I'm glad transaction I'm glad. between the claimant and Sandra Chartered Bank, uh, Bar Dubai branch and the IC branch, and all of those uh, sure. discontinue this, this um, in, uh, relationship. Or, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy um, that you gave me an opportunity to clarify that because it probably wasn't clear in my submission. But uh, there is a difference between legal personality and activities. So. Uh, if you think of Standard Chartered Bank as an individual person, <coughs> and they have an office in the DIFC and an office in uh, Bur Dubai, or, or then, uh, and assuming there's no uh, iPhones or any other technology which means you can conduct business in one from the other, or whatever, assuming that person has to physically go from one place to the other to conduct his business, in the DIFC, 
the business that's conducted here, in or from, is the words of the regulatory law, is subject to the rules and regulations here, and the business onshore is subject to the rules and regulations there. But it's the same person. So if someone had a problem with that person in onshore Dubai, it would sue that person. And if someone in the DIFC had a problem, it would sue the same person. It's the same individual. So you are assuming the DIFC standard headed bank should be res uh, res responsible for the activity taken care of by another branch? Uh, uh, no, I don't, I don't say it's going to... Well, it should be responsible, correct, in terms of legal liability. Yes. Okay. But um, the key point here is that there has been no activity which it conducted <clears throat> to, which is relevant in this case, over which uh, DIFC law applies. So it's the equivalent, if I take the example again, of the individual going to his office in Bern, Dubai and transacting a business, no one can say, oh, DIFC law applies to that transaction, because he's wearing two hats. One is DIFC hat and one is a Bern, Dubai hat. So, back again, to just rephrase my understanding. Sure. Your position is that Standard Chartered Bank is, uh, uh, is, is legally being brought to this claim, yes. but they are not responsible for the activity being taken care of out the IC. Uh, slightly different. If, is if that your position? It's, it, it is, a Standard Chartered Bank is a responsible corporate entity, wherever it is in the world. But different laws apply to it in different countries and different jurisdictions in this case. So you cannot say that Standard Chartered Bank is responsible for the activities of its London branch under DIFC law. You can't. And it's the same way you can't say that Standard Chartered Bank is responsible uh, under UAE law, onshore UAE law, when its activities are, when you're, when you're talking about the activities here. So the, again, the activity being taken care of Standard Chartered Bank by the Dubai branch, um, is it linked to the DIFC, uh, Standard Chartered Bank and DIFC, in another word, <coughs> um, can the Standard Chartered Bank argue about whether or not he was a, a right or wrong defendant brought to this proceeding, proceeding uh, for the activity being taken off outside the DIFC? Yeah, I think it, I, my, my submission is that it is, it is the right defendant. It was a contractual counterparty. It's just the law that the claimant says it breached was not applicable to it. Yeah. Now get back to the law. Yes. So what's your position on this? So, so the law that's applicable, it's not my duty, with all due respect, to dictate what the law is should be. I, my job is to defend the, uh, the case. Yeah. The case is brought on DIFC law. Right. And my submission is that DIFC law cannot be applicable to the activities that are complained about. And the alternative? It, it, it's likely, although this is a, 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 not my submission to make, but it's likely to be the onshore laws and the onshore banking regulations. Excellent. Likely to be the UAE. Correct. How we can determine this dispute without having an expert in UAE? Well, if the matter was brought, if the claim was brought under UAE law, then we would not be making this application. Yeah, but uh, again, <coughs> I'm trying to, to help you. I'm trying yes. to, 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 you know, to be all of us on the same page, so underline mm -hmm. when I give my judgment, so uh, this type of thought is being discussed with the council. Absolutely. So, uh, <coughs> if your position is very straightforward, this is clear, it has to be dealt with, with that, and without the, the DIFC law, that means some specific law has to be dealt with, and that specific law would be a foreign law for the DIFC judge, the DIFC court. So then it has to be dealt with in the expert opinion, which is not being filed in this application. So understanding what is the, the law of the UAE when, when it has come to a limitation of uh, 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 procedure, or what is the law in UAE or England in terms of obligation of both parties in this type of banking transaction. Uh, this is where my type the judge sit uh, in the DIC court to decide whether he should continue with this claim or he should dismiss this claim with, with immediate judgment. I hope I, I, I express my very, very, The point is very clear. Um, the, the, 
My, my, my response to that is that um, it is not the defendant's duty to dictate what law should be applied to the activities. The claimant has very clearly stated which laws have been breached, or it alleges to have been breached. DIFC, all of them DIFC laws. And whilst we say that that's not the applicable law, and it's likely UAE law where the activities took place, <coughs> um, again, that's not a question for immediate judgment. And in my humble submission, it's not something we would need expert evidence on now. That's something that would go to trial. Exactly. So what is my question for me is whether the claimant would have a real perspective to win this claim or not, right? Based on which law? It must be UAE law, based so, on the facts that as I've seen them. Yeah, so... Th I, but, I, but he hasn't brought it as UAE law. No, how, how, can I, how can I come to that conclusion that the claimant has no any real perspective to win this claim and dismiss uh, his claim and you know, uh, accept your application for immediate judgment without getting to that law? B because the claimant hasn't brought his claim under UAE law. And he, it's absolutely the claimant's duty, as stated in paragraph 17.43 of the uh, um, rules of the DIC court, you must state the basis of your claim. And he hasn't done that. And it's, it's not our duty to do that, and frankly, it's not the court's duty to do that either. No, what I'm, yeah. what I'm trying to say is very early to decide on this. Excuse me? It's, it's, it's very early to decide on this. This is where to need, maybe need a further procedure to go with the, the claim and identify the claim and the law applicable to that claim. With, with all due respect, claimants who are advised by counsel especially have to decide what law they bring their claims under. You can't try again later. If the defendant had said, we think DIFC law, sorry, the claimant had said, we think DIFC law applies to these claims, and if it doesn't, UAE law replies, and this is why. That's a very different case to the one we have today. They've put all of their um, uh, uh, eggs in one basket, as they say. There's one claim here under the rules of the DIFC. If that doesn't apply, and with all due respect, Your Honour is perfectly within the rule book to say there's no claim here. You, there is no reason to explore what other laws might be relevant or might not be. The laws of another country completely could be relevant, but that's not what the claimant has asked for. Um, and to offer the claimant the opportunity to think about what other laws might be applicable would be an abuse of the process, because they've had plenty of opportunity to say what other laws are applicable. Now, in my, my understanding, the claimant already made his opinion very clear that the PIC laws and regulations apply in this uh, claim. He didn't uh, list show any kind of laws. So he said the PIC laws by default should apply. The defendant, when he applied for the admitted judgment, said that, no, no, this is not a right approach. The DIC law shouldn't apply. And this is why we get in that situation where I am asking you if I'm not going to apply the DIC law, yes, then I need to apply the other law, which is need expert in that law. Well, and this is not the right course, course to do through the admitted judgment or before the you know, the, the actual trial where, the trial where the expert in, UAE, in that particular you're governing that dispute, mm -hmm. which is, will be determined by the trial judge later on, um, uh, will, 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 will ask the oh, expert on that law to uh, I see. I, I, see case. I think I see the distinction. I think, perhaps, and correct me if I'm wrong, Please. Uh, you're, you're wanting to know if DIFC law doesn't apply, how does this court decide whether to grant this immediate judgment or not, because that's a DIFC law matter. If, that, if my understanding is correct, that's a separate question, and I, I may have misunderstood this. The law applicable to this application and the rules of process of this court are very much the DIFC laws. So the DIFC rule book applies, the time bar rules apply if, 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 if uh, DIFC law or the underlying claim is applicable. But ultimately, the immediate judgment application all the, the only question, put it another way, the only question that um, this court needs to decide is um, has the claimant brought a cause of action that is realistically likely to succeed? And the answer is binary, yes or no. We say the answer is no because the, the basis of the law he was brought it on is 
inapplicable, is not applicable to this case, to the activities that he's complaining about. And that's fine. If the answer to that is no, then you grant the immediate judgment. There is no complaint about whether they brought the right law. There's no analysis of UAE law required for that question. It's simply a matter of Part 24. Um, uh, but if your, <coughs> your Honour is not convinced that um, DIFC law is not applicable, then the answer is, okay, well, I, I accept um, the claimant. DIFC law and all the regulations are applicable, and this matter must proceed to trial, and that's where we'll decide whether the activities complained of broke DIFC laws. That's the only question. I don't think UAE law is completely irrelevant for the purpose of the analysis, in my, in my humble opinion. Um, all we have to decide is, is DIFC law applicable to this case? My learned friend has not given any alternative. He could have said, well, okay, if the DFSA law isn't applicable, central bank regulation, X, Y, Z. No, you don't have any. None of that. He could have, in which case, this summary judgment, this application would have been for half of the case, not the other half. I hope that explains your yes, yes, position. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yep. Your Honour, with your permission. Uh, an interesting point was made by my learned counsel, and he, a question was posed by the court. If DIFC law does not apply, then which other law shall apply? And the response of my learned counsel was that it is not for me, it's not for the courts, it is for the claimant to decide which law will apply. But all I'm trying to tell you is the DIFC law will not apply. The reason why this line of argument does not appear to me to be legally sustainable is for the following reasons. If they are saying that the IFC law does not apply, then they should also be in a position to say which law applies. Because you cannot throw an arrow in the air without knowing where is the target. In this particular case, if I have argued extensively before this honorable court, and now I'm going to point out to you the relevant provision of the law, which will settle to rest any controversy. My learned counsel just now argued before you that Standard Chartered Bank, UK, is incorporated entity in the DIFC. It is regulated by the laws of the DIFC. He said it is a licensed central establishment. Now, Your Honor, I draw the attention of this honorable court to current case, which is yeah, volume three. I know what it is. Uh, Your Honor, there is one point yeah. I want to read from this case. Please. Now, at paragraph um, 42 of this judgment, mm -hmm. it says Article 10 of the DIFC law reads in part Center establishments, which is this particular bank, shall not may, shall carry out their activities in accordance with the center's laws, center's regulations, and the licenses issued to them. A distinction was made. He said, I have not commented in the IGPL case when he spoke about Kazakhstan. The question was, if, IG, if this standard chartered bank does anything happens in Kazakhstan, in Almaty, will, will they come to DFC courts and sue them here? Now, a counter question to that is, when you set up a company or an institution or an authorized entity in the DIFC, you are licensed to do business within DIFC and outside of DIFC to the extent it is permitted by the terms of your license. You are not permitted to go beyond the frontiers of UAE and do business outside with an entity because then you will be governed by the regulations of that country, of that financial institution in that country. Now, by the same analogy, by the same logic, if something happens in Almaty, then there is a financial center there, there are their own regulations that will be determined because Standard Chartered Bank cannot do business in Almaty, Your Honor, 
unless it is registered in Almaty. Standard Chartered Bank needs to be specifically incorporated in Almaty in order to do business in Almaty. So that logic does not hold good. Current case, he says, refers only to jurisdiction. I don't doubt that at all. But current case lays down an important proposition of law, which is, if you are, it's first it defines what is a licensed center establishment. It says Article 2 of the DIC law provides that license, any, any entity licensed, registered, or otherwise authorized to carry on the financial and business banking, uh, 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 those act, and business referred to in Article 9 of the law. And then it says center establishments, any entity or business to be established or carry on activity in the center, including any licensed center establishments. Current case comes forward and says, if you are an entity that is regulated in the DIFC, by the DIFC, and you are doing business in and from DIFC, then the issue is you are a licensed center establishment. If you are a licensed center establishment, Article 10 of DFC law says you are governed by the terms of the license. You cannot, so Article 10 comes to our rescue. Article 10 settles the issue. It says center establishments shall carry out their activities in accordance with center laws. Now, a very simple question to the opposite, to my opponent is, if Article 10 says that center establishments shall carry out their activities in accordance with center laws, they have to carry out because they are permitted to do business within DIFC and outside of DIFC, within UAE. If they do business within DIFC, they are still bound by those same laws. If they do business outside of DIFC, within mainland Dubai, they are still bound by those laws and regulations. In fact, there is either this court has to overrule Kuril and mm -hmm. say that the definition of license center establishment is not the same. Either this court has to redraft Article 10 and say that licensed center establishments shall only be responsible for their conduct within the IFC. Licensed center establishments can do any misconduct outside of the IFC and they shall not be held responsible in the IFC. Again, Your Honor, the issue is not which law this court will apply. In fact, this court is the guardian of the rules and regulations that are here in this country. This is the supervisory court. <coughs> this court shall uphold, shall determine whether a regulatory breach has taken place or not. Now to answer this point, because I want to give you a specific reference. Your Honor, I invite your attention to uh, the first, only one paragraph of the court of first instance in Bank Sarasin case. And this is uh, volume three. Uh, um, uh, authorities bundle. Yes. Paragraph 306, uh, which is at page, paragraph um, 306 is at page 71. Now, Your Honor, there are two paragraphs that I want to specifically rely upon. Paragraph 306 and paragraph 307. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, paragraph 307. My apologies. Yeah. Paragraph 307. Now, Your Honor, a question was raised that Bank Sarasin was a very hard fought case and it cannot be relied upon in this case because there are several issues. I think I have gone through both the judgments with absolute precision. And I can tell you that the, and the only difference, the Bank Sarasin case is almost identical to our case. The only difference is that they were both entities within DIFC. With the, this was an entity within the IFC, so there was no question. There was no question as such of the regulatory law. I'm very apologise. I just have to clarify that both defendants were not. Sorry, the one defendant. I'm on the of our defendant two. I'm not even thank you. Thank you. Defendant, because the issue is in this bank sourcing case, the issue is there were no separate purchases, as I said. The same, they were leveraged. They they were closed. Margins called were there. Issue was closed. Now, at page, at paragraph 3, I'm not reading this out of context, because we have relied on this case. This case is the basis. This case gives the jurisdiction to this court to look into these matters. At paragraph 307, I refer to it, I read yeah. as follows. When the court was looking at it, they said, my answer, therefore, to the question, where the breaches of the DFSA rules 
Again, they had filed a claim on the basis of Article 94 of the DFSA rules. Where the breaches of the DFSA rules committed intentionally, recklessly, or negligently. Your Honor, you also asked this question, the same question which this court had posed just now. And you said, say in one word. And the answer is yes. The breaches of the COB rules 3.2.2 were committed intentionally. The breaches of COB 6.2.1 were committed recklessly. Second question, was the loss or damage in respect of which compensation is claimed as a result of such conduct? This is what the court has to see. What is my case? My case is same as Bank Sarasan case. My case is this is the breach of the regulatory law. Court said these are the three questions I have to look into. And the second question the court asked in the Bank Sarasan case, was this conduct of this particular bank responsible for your loss? This was the question. And the question before this court is the same. It seems very odd to me and absolutely out of logic if one were to argue that DFC law is not the applicable law. I mean, I'm looking at the, I'm not looking at, I'm looking at the regulatory law. The regulatory law is the substantive law of this region. It is an authorized entity. No other law can apply to an authorized entity operating in the DFC other than the DFC law. In fact, there can be no doubt about it. But my learned counsel says that it is not my responsibility to say what law this is. If you are not so sure about what law will apply, how did you file this application for immediate judgment before this honorable court and said that this case should be dismissed because DFC law does not apply? If you say DFC law does not apply, then you must be knowing of which law applies because there is no other law known to us. And he said, I put all my eggs in one basket. Your Honor, I have put all my eggs in the legal basket because the only opportunity, the only thing available to me is the regulatory law of the DFC. It will apply to all authorized firms. So this is how I would like to respond to this question. Then there was another question that was raised is that official letter is not a requirement that we came to know about our loss much earlier. And official letter was not a requirement for this. So we are deemed to have knowledge of the same. Your Honor, loss, I may, it is like the result of an exam. Have I passed? Have I not passed? I have not done well in my exam, but I am still hoping I will pass. But until the final day when my result comes in an exam, I know whether I have passed or failed. That is the ultimate date. In the instant case, due to my interaction with Standard Chartered Bank, I came to know there is some loss. But I was not able to know exactly what is the loss. On this day, 10th of this 2013, I came to know that my loss is 799,500 something. So I could not have known of this loss before. So from the date I came to know of the loss, the cause of action has accrued to me to file a complaint asking them for my loss, for the deductions that they have made, for the loss that has occasioned to me as a result of their wrongful conduct. Then, Your Honor, another, I don't want to go into another point, but one very critical admission has been made before this court today by my learned counsel. He said, loan agreement, it is true that date is not known. And he also said, it will be interesting to know. But that's not relevant. These are exactly the words of my learned counsel. Now, what does that prove, Your Honor? That proves that my learned counsel agrees that the facility agreement, pursuant to which they allege a facility of 2 million was provided to me, they themselves don't know the date on which it was filed. Now, whether we are talking about UA law, whether we are talking about DIC law, the issue is, no matter which law applies, if you don't have the relevant documentation in place, what sort of records have you maintained? Does it mean that UA law will say that you should not maintain the record and DIC law says you should maintain the record? Both laws will protect you. Both laws will come, will say the same thing. They are not even sure, Your Honor, that on the basis of this, whether this will work, on which date this loan agreement was signed. Now, loan agreement is a very important agreement because they have deducted money. 
If this loan agreement does not exist, if this loan facility was not in place, how could they charge me the interest which they have charged under the IRS agreement? They could not have charged that interest. Now, these are issues that cannot be determined in an immediate judgment application, Your Honor. These issues can only be determined by this, by in a trial where the court has to establish facts. Now, in an immediate judgment application, if the court is not able to establish facts, then court will dismiss that immediate judgment application. In the instant case, Your Honor, this immediate judgment application is definitely caused delay to the proceedings. It has wasted exorbitant amount of time, caused delay and expenses to us, and has been filed without any legal basis. My, uh, and, and then there are some other arguments of my learned counsel, which I don't feel, I, I think I have already expressed enough uh, uh, on, on those issues. But I would like to uh, conclude with two important points, Your Honor, uh, because all other points are otherwise clearly established, which is that what is not in dispute is which law will apply. Because anyone that is licensed in DIFC, they will only be governed by the DIFC regulatory law. This is not in dispute. This cannot even be, there is not even a scope for such an argument. So, I refuse to understand how can someone argue that this DFC re regulatory law shall not apply to a licensed center establishment. Within, he just clarified to you, my learned counsel, he said that no, we agree with you that Standard Chartered Bank, UK, is the incorporated entity. And he said, the branch, very correctly he said, that branch has no independent legal personality. Branch, the conduct of the branch will relate to the parent company. If parent company is a regulated entity, then parent company is bound by the regulations. If parent company is bound by the regulations, then regulatory law must necessarily apply. It, there is no other scope or inter interpretation possible. So, Your Honor, I conclude with these points that this application for immediate judgment does no, has the claimant has not the defendant has not been able to, to put forth a case that there are no compelling reasons. I have demonstrated to you that there are not one but seven compelling reasons why this case must go to trial. So, Your Honor, along with costs, this application must be dismissed. We have suffered delay and there must be a procedure in place so that we could immediately proceed with the trial. Right. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, before we close, in, <clears throat> I have two questions. Uh, <clears throat> maybe both of them wasn't raised by both counsel in their statement or their submission, but just that will help me to make my opinion. Uh, the first one, maybe for the <coughs> claimant, the respondent in this application. Um, I always wonder when I go through this case, whether the claimant did the right decision by bringing this claim in DIC court by analyzing the, the fact that the, the branch was uh, dealt with by the claimant is the Bar Dubai branch, which is outside the DIC. And it might be somewhere down the road, the court might find later on, even if approached the tribe, the DIC court is the uh, forum non convenience for this dispute to deal with. So the question in first place, it could be a strategy of the claimant, but as a logically, do you, does the, the claimant strongly believe this claim has to go with the, with the DIC court? Uh, or, or why the claimant didn't thought about bringing this claim against the defendant uh, before the Dubai court, being the, the, court, the seat, the, the, the seat of the, 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 the branch dealt with uh, from Bar Dubai? Um, if you can, if you are in a position to answer this. Yes, sir. Uh, I know this is, wasn't pleaded by the applicant as a form of convenience, but this is something that will help me to conclude my opinion. Yes, sir. Then I move to the applicant for the last question. Your Honor, uh, if, I, if I remember, I have, this is the point that I argued. Um, uh, in the current case, for example, uh, the issue was the same. It was an employee in the Jabal Ali branch of Barclays Bank. And that had nothing to do with the IFC. My case is, first let me respond specifically to the question before I go into the example. 
Your Honor, your question was, could I have filed this case in DIC, Dubai courts? Because they are the courts uh, where this branch is located. But the problem is, it is for me, I could not have gone to Dubai courts. And even if I would have gone to Dubai courts, the Dubai courts would have referred the case back to DIC courts. Or they would have dismissed my case. Why? Because what law will the Dubai courts apply? What violations have taken place? What breaches have taken place? The only breaches that have taken place in this case, Your Honor, are the breaches of the DIC regulatory law. That only because, because it is not the branch. After all, I will have to sue not the branch of the Dubai. And the party will be the SCB, Standard Chartered Bank UK, which is no why, standard. Why, why, standard why, why, is not, why not Standard Bank? Uh, because branch does not have an independent legal personality. A branch cannot be sued. A branch can only be sued in the name of a parent company. Parent company is Standard Chartered Bank UK. So Standard Chartered Bank UK is incorporated, Your Honor, in the, DI, in the DIFC. So the incorporated entity is DIFC. Branch is not an incorporated entity. It is an unincorporated entity. That's what is held in court. Well, this is a little bit confusing my understanding of... Uh, inter I mean, there is a lot of UK banks being sued before the Dubai court. Yes, sir. And they are already a, a branch based in Dubai, so uh, I can, I'm not in a position to name the bank's name, but this is the fact that Dubai court still accepts the jurisdiction of cases against a UK banks or any international company has based and licensed by the Dubai Economic Department and UAE. But I know this is very hard maybe for you to come up with, with, with a, a reason why the DIC court wouldn't be the, uh, the forum non convenience for this dispute. Um, and maybe the client decides to do Your some Honor, I, I different like strategy. Advice. No, Your Honor. Yeah. But there is no different strategy at all. Because my case, you, you, Your Honor, this is exactly the, the point is very simple. We, I cannot sue in the name of a branch. No, no, I, understand. I can only sue the name of the principal. Now, that is the Standard Chartered Bank UK. Standard Chartered Bank UK is incorporated in the IFC. It but is a regulated entity. But all the agreement was signed under the Outside, same. because that is the, no, no, that no, is no, the that, duty of the foreign case. All the false agreement was signed under Outside. Standard Chartered Bank Dubai. Absolutely. Not the UK. It has nothing right. to do. Your Honor, in this case, now in this regard, I want to bring to your attention a paragraph in the current case, because that will, at least if I can point that out, Your Honor, with your permission, uh, otherwise, I will feel that I do not bring the relevant point to your attention. Your Honor, uh, for current case, we need to go to um, page, uh, current case is bundle, um, bundle 1, tab 12, bundle 1, tab 12. Uh, 12, yeah, 16, 16, 58, 58, 60. Is it bundle one or authority bundle? Authority is bundle, right? Page 81, you're on. Authority bundle? Authority bundle one. Page 81, running page 81. Yes. Your Honor, I have to read two, three paragraphs, so this is very important because this will settle all issues. At paragraph 58, this is uh, this is an uh, appeals court judgment. Yes. And it says the remarks I make below are expressed to be applicable to banks, but they are intended to apply to any corporation incorporated outside the DIFC, which has established an unincorporated licensed branch in the DIFC. A uh, center establishment must be legal entity because that is the only way in which the term entity used in Article 2 can be understood. Where a bank is licensed to carry on business in a place outside of its country. Now let us say Standard Chartered Bank. Standard Chartered Bank has been licensed in the IFC to carry out business outside its country. So it says where a bank is licensed to carry out business in a place outside its country of incorporation. It is necessary for that bank to carry on business either through an unincorporated, so there are two ways it can carry business, either through an unincorporated branch of the bank or through a separate legal entity which is a subsidiary of the bank. 
So bank can do business in one of two ways. Either it can set up a branch or it can set up a subsidiary. But in DIFC, they will not allow the bank to set up a subsidiary because subsidiary will have its own independent legal personality. For reasons of control, DFS, the regulator will say, you set up a branch because we want to hold the parent company, the parent branch in London responsible for any act that happens here. Then it says, bank regulators frequently, if not typically, require foreign banks to carry on mainstream business through a branch rather than a local subsidiary. However, it would be uncommon for an unincorporated branch of a foreign bank to be treated under the local law as a legal entity separate and distinct from its head office. This is the point. Unless it has been separately incorporated as a subsidiary. Here it was not incorporated as a subsidiary. It was incorporated as a branch. I cannot therefore accept the proposition advanced by the Deputy Chief Justice that a central establishment can be an entity which may be, to use the judge's words, within the corporation. A branch is no different in law from a division and a division of a corporation is a part of a corporation and no legal entity of its own, although it may be treated as an accounting entity for the purposes, the position of partnership for so and so, so and so, then come to paragraph 50, it follows that I cannot agree with the Deputy Chief Justice finding that what was licensed by the DFSA was an independent division of the respondent, which is capable of being treated as a legal entity for the purposes of Article 2, separate and distinct from the respondent itself. Paragraph 61, the branch of the respondent in the DFC contains two units called Barclays Capital and Barclays Wealth. The registered office for both units, as can be seen from their thing, is the same. Now come to paragraph 63. That is the natural and legal consequence of operating branch or a division of a bank, with that there is no separation of entity between an unincorporated branch of a foreign bank, such as this, and the foreign bank itself. So they are one, they are together. It is the fundamental principle of company law that the only way for a company to create another entity under its control and get legal separate for it is to incorporate a subsidiary. We didn't create a subsidiary here in the present context. Now the point that I want to come, which is relevant for this case, is coming now. It says, the Deputy Chief Justice summarized the argument for the appellant in paragraph 53 of a judgment which reads as follows. This is where I would like to focus on. The argument in favor of that jurisdiction is very simple. When by the process of registration of a business and the granting of necessary licenses, a center establishment is created. It is the entire corporation body to which the registration and those licenses are granted because the process involves registration and a grant in the name of the corporation alone and not in the name of any exclusive DIC person. Now, Your Honor, the point. Moreover, this is where I want to focus on, Your Honor. Moreover, when the corporation enters through its DIFC branch into a commercial transaction, it is the corporation as a whole that does so. Therefore, a dispute arising of a transaction entered into by a branch of a corporation located outside the DIFC, this is the point. Therefore, a dispute arising out of a transaction entered into by a branch, it is the branch, of the corporation located outside the DIFC is as much a dispute involving the central establishment as a dispute arising out of a transaction entered into a branch of that same international corporation authorized to carry on business within the DIFC. This is the point, Your Honor. Now, if I'm doing business by a branch, Your Honor, which is outside of DIFC, the Bank Dubai branch, but this business is being done on whose behalf? For and on behalf of the parent company which is Standard Chartered Bank UK. Now, if business is being done on its behalf by a branch which is outside of a DIFC and a dispute arises, this is as much a dispute as it is if the dispute would have arisen within DIFC. So, Your Honor, this is the basis why I was referring to Koren's case again and again because this drives home the point. There is no difference now. Thank you, <clears throat> but you didn't answer my question. Yes. My question was very simple why the claimant didn't decide to take this, the whole claim to the Dubai court? Because there are violations of the FC regulatory law that we pleaded, which we cannot plead in Dubai courts. Just one minute. The claimant can go to the Dubai court and file a case against Standard Chartered Bank, Bank Dubai, based on the contract signed in Dubai, based 
the defendant is a Dubai based, the claimant is a Dubai based, and the UAE law will govern that dispute. This is a, a strategy could be taken by the claimant. I'm not saying now, I'm not, not in the position to say you was right or wrong. I'm just, you know, this is one of those um, facts will come to my mind when I come up with my decision on this claim. Um, and I just want to analyze that even if this trial go, if this uh, claim will go to the trial, still always there is a room for the trial judge to decide that uh, he will not uh, say that the IC court will not have a, uh, doesn't have a jurisdiction of a standard as a bank, but he might come up with a decision that this is not the right forum and this is maybe, uh, this is for the trial judge if this is goes to the trial judge. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just analyzing the, the, the claimant uh, strategy in the first place uh, 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 when he made his claim to the IC court. Now, once the claimant, the defendant already stand up, maybe now to your question before you reply to this one. Uh, I, I mean, I, I wasn't, you know, uh, expecting like a straightforward answer. This is something I just want to, you know, discuss with you my thought when I go through this decision. If I may, or for once, I was going to try and help. Yes, please, my friend. Please. Uh, because I. But we are looking for just help. <laughs> All of us trying to find that. Because the, the the analysis of Corinth, I agree with, which is that. <laughs> Centre establishments under the judicial authority law are subject to the exclusive jurisdiction of the DIFC court. Whether or not we agree, you know, people agree to that in principle or not, that's been established now in the IGPL case. So, in some ways, there, this court has exclusive jurisdiction whether you like it or not. The question of forum non convenience is an important one because you might say, well, it's got nothing to do with this jurisdiction. The laws don't apply. The DFSA regulation doesn't apply. The activities didn't take place here. The witnesses are over in Dubai. The, uh, all of those for, things. This is something for the defendant to decide on later. Well, on. That, the, the point on that is, I think I've been overruled on arguing for non convenience, which is in the IGPL appeal case. Um, the IGPL party decide, uh, argued for non convenience. Yeah, but, but this wasn't one of your. Uh, I mean, no, it wasn't. But I, I, I'm not going to bring it because I would yeah. lose. Right. I would lose. Yeah. Um, because in that case of paragraph 194, it was very clearly held that the doctrine of foreign non convenience doesn't apply between courts in the UAE. Right. It's a multinational concept sure. of only a common law sure. jurisdiction. So, if, in fact, in the Saracen case, um, Swiss law was the applicable law to one aspect of the contract, it's not important which. Mm -hmm. And the court decided, sorry, Swiss jurisdiction, excuse me, mm -hmm. was applicable to one aspect of the case. And the court decided that the DIFC court is the more convenient forum because all the other cases were here. But you can't apply the same test um, as between Dubai courts and DIFC courts or Abu Dhabi courts or, or whatever else because the court held we, that's a common law concept amongst different countries. Sure. So I hope that's, that's helpful. Um, the, the one comment I would make as a, as a reward <laughs> for helping my friend is to say that the Corinth case and IGPL case were entirely about jurisdiction of the court. And my distinction, which I tried to make answering your questions earlier, is that that is a very separate topic to what activities you're doing where. Okay. So when you wear a hat, you wear your DIFC hat, you are subject to these rules. When you wear a Virgin by hat, you are subject to the rules. Thank you. Maybe the last question for you, I mean, it's, um, to what extent do you think, what, what, why this claim, shouldn't go to trial uh, as long as there is a, a, a technical area here we, we are looking for. I mean, in this kind of dispute, it's as a banking transactions involve, you know, uh, investment in specific product, product uh, and that might need more analysis and, 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 and expert opinion to decide whether the defendant fulfill his obligation or he uh, or the defendant uh, was guilty somewhere and then the this is for the trial judge to decide on the merits of the claim. So to what extent do you think this type of dispute shouldn't give that way to, uh, to to give it a chance for the trial to examine all of those, you know, technical issues of, of, of the dispute? Thank you. The um, provisions of the DIFC uh, court rule book allow for applications for immediate judgment. That, that's there in part 24. And the, the reason why uh, the defendant bought the application was to say that 
the claimants, and I'm, I'm breaking it down rather than um, uh, what was put in our pleadings, because it wasn't put this way, but essentially what the claimant has to establish is that he has a cause of action. What is the cause and what's the legal basis? The factual allegation is that Standard Chartered Bank missold the product to me. They didn't assess me properly. Um, this is, forget the law for a second. They're saying I was missold. They sold me something I didn't need, I didn't want, and it was too risky for me, essentially. Um, then they have to say, well, what law has been broken? And the laws of the DIFC only exclusively have been put forward. Okay? Now let's say that that law is the applicable law. Then the question is if you have to establish um, the factual matrix for uh, the breach of the law, and that requires causation and the other tests uh, in relation to how to establish liability. Now, the point I'm trying to make in this application is that you fail at step two in that analysis. So you cannot go further to examine the facts. The failure is because there's no legal basis for these claims. The claimant has put forward and relied wholly on DRFC law. My argument is that it doesn't apply, and therefore there's no need to examine the facts. The claimant could well have brought the claim under the correct law, and then we would have proceeded to trial, subject to time bar and other restrictions. See, the problem here is the defendant, by deducting amount of amount of money from the claimant, that caused uh, a situation where it need to be uh, need to be argued by both parties, um, and that argue should goes to the proper trial to, uh, to examine the fact and, uh, and, and, and uh, the contract terms and see whether uh, the defendant did what they did in the right action. Or, so this is all those kind of you know, allegations and, and, and uh, situations probably need to be examined by proper procedure. I, with, with respect, I would, I would disagree. I think we have been very careful not to ex get into the facts because uh, our client has taken the opportunity uh, or, or taken up its rights under the DIFC court rule book to apply for immediate judgment, which allows you to do it without examining all the facts if you have a basis to dismiss the case without that. Um, again, it goes back to that point about it would be interesting. Now, my learned friends tried to say, well, you know, my, my, my opponent has accepted that you need to know whether this contract was signed and when. That wasn't the point of thing. I frankly do not know, as counsel to the claimant, what the facts and circumstances were around that contract. The only point I know is that DIFC law doesn't apply and therefore the claim must stop there. In principle, I understand your honor is saying, well, this is a, you know, this individual or this company is out of pocket because they made a bad investment and we need to examine that. No, no, my, I, the only fact I'm, 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 I'm really you know, rely on, and, and this is might be the, the, the main fact, yeah. is, is, is what happened in 2013, you know, when the bank decided to deduct the uh, amount of money from the claimant, and this is where the claimant came to this court and said, look, this is what happened, and uh, we think this is done uh, without any legal basis, and we need to brought action against that claim, against that defendant. The defendant come to this court and file amended judgment and say, no, we need to dismiss this case because there is no perspective at at all for the claimant to win his claim. And, and, and this is where I came to that, you know, dark area to like to find out whether that action done by the claimant, by the defendant, was it to be assessed in the proper procedure, deducting the money from the claimant uh, 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 account. And this is where you need to go through uh, uh, a stage where it can be examined. And this is that even if the claimant wouldn't win his case, but at least he has an argue case to deal with in, 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 uh, in, in the trial. I understand that. Um, I, with, all, with all due respect to the claimant company, uh, which alleges it um, uh, was sold a bad investment. No, we didn't come to the bad investment. I mean, or, or even I'm the, just, I'm the, just the timing about, of the... I'm just, I'm, I'm not, I'm just focused yeah. on the fact itself. No, I understand. The fact that some money been deducted from the claimant 
I'm not arguing about whether there was a bad advice, whether the, he, the bank, you know, act without or with advice, direction from the claimant. All that type of thing, arguable. But the fact that an action has been done by the claim, by the defendant, and the claimant come to argue about the action, this is uh, the area where uh, it could be worth it to uh, give it more weight. And well, I, I do have some sympathy for the claimant because his claim could have been brought on different grounds and we wouldn't have a right to claim an immediate judgment. Well, I'm back again to your position. I mean, what I'm asking you, do you think that fact itself is not a good basis for uh, the claimant to go through the trial? Correct. The fact it's, not, it's not enough to dismiss this application. It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not enough basis for uh, uh, real prospective to, 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 to win the claim? No, because let's say that, um, let's say for example that Standard Chartered Bank had acted, and I'm not making any admission in case that's confused, had acted completely terribly in deducting monies that weren't due from the client's account, selling it a product which was completely inappropriate, and I'm not saying this is no. fraud, but just bad, Assuming. bad behavior, okay? <laughs> Um, even in those cases, it, it should stop an immediate judgment because he brought, the claimant brought the claim under the wrong law. And that, the bank shouldn't suffer because the claimant was advised to do that. And by suffer, I mean take this case to the again, which mean? It, it said that it was in breach of all these DIFC laws, and my position is that those laws aren't applying. If, if you haven't based your claim on the right law, now if, if the claimant came to say, um, we were missold this product and it breached the laws of Malaysia. Um, and yet the facts of the case really showed, or at least the way the claimant presented it, showed the bank to have behaved terribly. You can't take the case forward. Because Malaysian law has absolutely no um, relevance and to this. Unless both parties agree to it. This and unless they agree to it. Yeah. Exactly. That's fine. Yes. Um, but I'm saying that's exactly the same position. Now, I called it Malaysia in that example, but in reality it's DIFC law that's being claimed. I'm saying both of those aren't applicable. So no matter how um, justifiable the facts are in terms of leading analysis and trials and everything else, unfortunately the law applicable, it just has to stop there. Um, hmm. And the bank shouldn't be forced to conduct a very expensive, time-consuming trial if the claimant brought the claim under the wrong law. And if Your Honour can decide whether it was the right law or wrong law, then we either go away or we come back for trial. All right. Um, is it both of you want to say anything about the statement of cost before we close this hearing today? Or I have two statements of cost from both parties. <coughs> So maybe the applicant wants to say first something. Mm -hmm. um, Your Honour, I don't want to keep you any longer, but we do have... As long as you pay for the court. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we do have some submissions in relation to costs. Yes, a uh, nice submission, I would say. I mean, I'm not going to the detail, but if you want to bring my attention to any of what I've been... Yeah, I mean, they are, I mean, one thing we can do, because we do ask for costs on an indemnity basis in this matter, um, on the basis that we really shouldn't be, shouldn't have uh, expended the, the, the monies that our client has expended on this case given the performance of the claimant. Yes. Um, but it is a couple of pages, even more, of submission. So I wonder whether if we put it in writing to you, um, that might be more helpful. Because ultimately, costs will probably go how you decide the case. Um, so if we put it to your writing and then you can do with it what you will when you decide the, the application. Would you say anything about uh, uh, Your Honour, I'm happy if we, uh, we can do it in writing, but I have a few questions because he made some, my learned counsel made some observations that merit a reply. On that? Uh, my, uh, my learned counsel, you know, he raised some, because he was in an attempt, uh, I, I understand his interpretation of current and he said he's trying to assist, but rather the f uh, re let me now uh, assist him in uh, understanding uh, the few issues uh, which are relevant. Now, if you, he said a very interesting point two minutes ago. He said, I don't know 
the uh, facility agreement. I don't know the facts surrounding the facility agreement. I have not gone into the facts at all. And all I'm saying is that the DRC law does not apply. Now, this is a submission that he made before this honorable court a few minutes ago. Now, in response to what he stated, I mean, I don't want to take you through a voluminous detail, but just want to draw your reference. There was a case that was referred to this honorable court, mm -hmm. which is J.D. Weatherspoon, which my learned counsel discussed during this presentation. And I want to take you straight to two paragraphs, which simply answer the point. One is paragraph 11, and this is on an immediate judgment application. The principles. Uh, the court says, it is well established that in a case which turns on disputes of fact, the summary judgment procedure is inappropriate if it would involve the court conducting a mini trial on the documents, including the witness statements, or undertaking a minute and protected examination, minute and protracted examination of the documents, and then there are the two cases. And the second point in paragraph 14, which I want to refer as well, is I do not consider that summary judgment applications are in principle appropriate. They are based on a particular interpretation of facts which are in dispute and not unusually in the case of allegations of fraud and dishonesty on the inferences to be drawn from the established fact. And that it says Mr. Warden accepted and indeed asserted that the alleged inferences which the claimant seeks to draw must be assessed in light of all the documents in the light of substantial factual and documentary evidence in the present case and the matters which are in dispute. This is to my mind precisely the type of mini trial of disputed facts on the documents for which summary judgment procedure is inappropriate. And finally, one word the court says at paragraph 31, for these reasons and other reasons they say, I dismiss the defendant's application for summary judgment. Your Honor, I did not refer to this earlier, it was already there in my cover in my page. The point is very simple. Right now, are we conducting whether the only issue before this court is whether my claim is fanciful or I have some ground on the basis of which my, I can sustain my case. I think that is the only point for determination before the court and the arguments that we have been debated amongst each other could more appropriately be addressed on merits in the, before, the, before the trial court. My point, Your Honor, is that on this limited, limited point, unfortunately, the defendant has failed to demonstrate to this court that it has compelling reasons that this case will not proceed to trial. We have seen, they are not even sure on if the actual law does not apply, what other law will apply. So they, they are not even sure on this particular agreement that is in place or the circumstances and the facts surrounding those agreements. We have seen JW over the court case which says that the court must look into the totality of facts. Court must be satisfied. If there are allegations of fraud, if there are allegations of misrepresentation, then this is not an appropriate case for, uh, uh, for an immediate judgment. So my humble request is this should be, uh, this application must be dismissed with costs. Thank you. Would you say anything about the cost? Uh, I would like to give a written submission in this regard. So at this stage, I think we need to close this hearing and uh, we'll reserve the judgment of a couple of weeks and we'll issue it, inshallah. All right? All right.